the 19th century, the tension between the establishment in Britain and the people they had power over was immense. Ordinary working people couldn't vote, nor did have very many legal rights to protect them from the state or an exploitative employer. And Manchester played a key role in that ongoing struggle, with some of the early socialist chartists and some radical revolutionary ideas from Engels and Marx. And it was here that one of the bloodiest days in British politics had unfolded, the Peterloo Massacre. And politics was slowly changing too, slowly being the operative word, not just here, but across the sea as well. By the 1860s, the issue at the heart of capitalism in the US was slavery, and it had sparked a civil war. Britain was one of the largest purchasing markets of cotton grown in southern states, where slavery was the bedrock of the trade. Now, when these states seceded from the Union to form the Confederacy, a civil war broke out. Early battles went in favour of the Confederates, and it was clear that this would be a long and bloody conflict. President Abraham Lincoln appealed to Britain to boycott Southern cotton in order to help the cause of freedom. In 1862, Lancashire rose in support, despite three quarters of all cotton imported to Lancashire coming from those Southern states. Very soon, the embargo led to masses of temporary unemployment and a backlash in places like Liverpool, where support for the Confederates was strong. The backlash spread as the desperation sunk in around the north of England. But at a historic vote at the Free Trade Hall, cotton workers voted to keep the embargo going, despite the personal cost to them. The action touched Lincoln, who wrote a letter to the working people of Manchester, thanking them for their tremendous act of solidarity. And part of that letter is inscribed here on the statue of Abraham Lincoln in Lincoln Square, and is the whole reason we have a statue of Abraham Lincoln within Manchester city centre in the first place. And in that letter he describes the act of heroism which has not been surpassed in any age or in any country. It's worth pointing out here that Manchester was still a city built partly on slavery, being a huge importer of cotton from the US for years. But the decision to boycott the cotton was a bold and historic moment for Manchester, and one it should be quite proud of. It was also an opportunity to seize the moral high ground against its bitter rival, Liverpool, which had powerful Confederate and slavery links. In the second half of the century, Manchester continued to grow, but also diversified. A gradual move away from cotton and textile production helps the city develop a stronger economic base. The coming of the Ship Canal and the establishment of the world's first industrial estate at Trafford Park meant that the city was now employing more and more people in a range of jobs, from dock workers to chemical production. Now we did touch on this a couple of videos ago, and also saw that the population of Manchester had rocketed from 71,000 in 1809 to 303,000 by 1851. But from the 1870s, something strange happened. Slum clearances, municipal housing and posh middle-class suburbs had begun to affect the population. While the city as a whole was expanding into new districts in the south and north, the actual population of the city centre fell for the first time. When Manchester's population peaked in 1931 at 766,300 people, the actual number of people living in the city centre was just 50,000, fewer than in 1801. So let's look again at that expansion. New suburbs were developing as the city spread beyond its ancient boundaries. New red brick terraced houses, now synonymous with the north of England, were built to a higher standard than the former slums, and began to appear around the surrounding fields and pastures. Those new suburbs became Charlton on Medlock, Hume, Gorton, Cheetham, Fallowfield, Withington, and so on. On the other side of the River Irwell, the same thing was happening in Salford. Conditions were slowly improving, but that poverty we've seen for the last two videos was still rampant. In 1834, the government decided it was spending too much on poverty. But instead of tackling the exploitation and the wage labour which had caused all of this, 
it decided to introduce the new poor law. Now this saw the widespread adoption of workhouses, places where people were forced to work and basically treated like criminals. Help for poor children came in the form of ragged schools, which provided basic education, food and clothing for children too ragged to attend Sunday school. Now there were two in Manchester's poorest suburb, Angel Meadow, Charter Street and here at Sharp Street. Now before this building was constructed in 1866, what was here had become a meeting house for thieves and prostitutes. Once turned into a ragged school, it provided vital relief to hundreds of local children, many victims of the Irish potato famine. It also provided help for those affected by the cotton famine, instigated by the American Civil War. By the end of the century, it had extended help to pretty much anyone who needed it, including young women vulnerable on the streets. In 1870, thanks to pressure from campaigners, the government passed the Education Act, which established state funding for elementary schools. Now, this also meant the establishment of school boards, which oversaw education within a certain locality. Now, the Act also allowed for women to vote for and stand for positions on the school boards. Now, as menial as this seems, it actually changed everything. <laughs> For women who'd been getting involved in social change for years, this provided them with an opportunity to show that they could take positions of authority too. And one such woman was Lydia Becker, who was born here on Cooper Street. A highly intelligent person with an interest in botany and astronomy, Becker established the Ladies Literary Society in Manchester in 1867, followed by the Manchester Women's Suffrage Committee with other local radicals like Emily Davis and Elizabeth Wolsenholm. Through the organisation, she got to know Richard Pankhurst, a barrister who was a strong vocal advocate for women's rights. Later that year, a local lady named Lily Maxwell, who owned a crockery shop in Chorlton on Medlock, mistakenly appeared on the electoral roll, and was encouraged by women suffragists like John Bright and Lydia Becker to go to the local town hall to cast her vote. The idea was that she could be used as a test case for the law. Now, a handful of wealthy women had actually voted in Britain before the 1832 Reform Act defined a voter as a man. Lily Maxwell would become the first woman to vote since that specification had been made. Becca continued to be a leading voice for women's suffrage for the rest of her life. Unlike many of her fellow campaigners, Becca was one of the first to argue that there was no natural difference between the intelligence of women and the intelligence of men. After she was elected to the Manchester School Board in 1870, she organised a nationwide speaking tour for other prominent women in the movement. One event in 1874 took place back here in Manchester, and in attendance was a 15-year-old girl called Emmeline Golden. Golden was born in 1858 on Sloan Street in Moss Side, to the south of the city. Today the street has a new name and a new look, but in the 1850s this was typical red brick terraced housing. Well read at a young age and well educated in the history of politics, a young Emmeline was already growing naturally into the role of a radical and that was despite the icy hands of society already clawing at her, holding her back just for being a girl. In her autobiography she even recalls a time when she feigned sleep one night when her father came into her room to check on her and how he said to himself, pity she wasn't born a lad. At the age of 20, Emmeline met Richard Pankhurst, and a year later, in 1879, they married here, and eventually moved to London to begin life anew. The couple had five children in 10 years, but continued to be politically active. Eventually, they returned to Manchester, where Emmeline became even more radical in her activism. The cause of women's suffrage became the principal focus of her life, and something she passed on to all of her children. After the death of Richard in 1898, the family moved to a small house at 62 Nelson Street, but Emmeline only stepped up her activism. So far to win the vote, campaigners had continuously petitioned Parliament and tried to build a movement of support in high places. But the whole thing had gotten nowhere. Frustrated at doors constantly being closed in her face, in 1903, Pankhurst founded the Women's Social and Political Union, a suffragette organisation which used civil disobedience and direct action to bring attention to their cause. 
Deeds, not words, will become our permanent motto, she said. And once again, we're back at the Free Trade Hall for another standout moment in Manchester's history. Because it was on the 13th of October, 1905, that the first action of the suffragette movement took place. It was here at a political rally of the Liberal Party that Emmeline's oldest daughter, Christabel, and fellow activist Annie Kenny chose to strike. On the stage that night were four future Prime Ministers, including David Lloyd George and Winston Churchill, who was an MP in Oldham at the time. Churchill had already made it clear he was against women's voting. Decades later, after seeing a woman MP in the House of Commons, he remarked to a friend that it was as embarrassing as if she'd seen me naked in my bath. Pankhurst and Kenny intended to disrupt the meeting and force the question, and they made banners. And on that banner, it said, would the Liberal Party give votes for women? But they decided to cut that down to simply votes for women. A slogan which was born here and became synonymous with women's suffrage all over the world. They disrupted the meeting with shouts of votes for women, but were told to shut up and put their question in writing. And when they did, the men on stage simply dismissed it and said they wouldn't be discussing that tonight. And eventually, the women were thrown out onto the street. Fully intending to get arrested, Christabel spat in the direction of a police officer, who initially did nothing. Eventually, the pair were arrested and spent four days in strange ways. The first women in British history to go to prison for a political cause. It's worth mentioning here that Annie Kenny was quite special to the movement. Unlike the other major activists, including the Pankhurst, Annie was not middle class. She came from a poor family in Spring Head and had lost part of her finger working in a cotton spinning mill. But her passion for the cause was inspiring. After the meeting, the focus of the activism became nationwide, and the Pankhurst and their fellow suffragettes engaged in a variety of tactics, including hunger strikes, arson, and vandalism, which often led to their arrest and imprisonment. Emmeline herself was arrested several times and went on hunger strikes in prison, which resulted in forced feeding by the authorities. Manchester was a key location for the suffragette movement and Emmeline played a leading role in organising rallies, demonstrations and other events in the city. The WSPU's headquarters were located in Manchester and Pankhurst and her fellow suffragettes used the city as a base for their activities throughout the north of England. It was at Manchester Art Gallery in 1913 that three activists, Annie Briggs, Evelyn Manester and Lillian Forrester, stayed behind after closing and smashed the glass of several pre-Raphaelite paintings, which they thought showed an old-fashioned derogatory vision of feminism. The destruction of property tactic was effective at securing publicity, but many began to feel that it was actually harming the progress of the mission. Nationwide, support for women's suffrage was quite high, but many in the movement began to feel that it was time to go back to petitioning and rallying. Emmeline and Christabel disagreed. As wonderful as it was to have four women from the same family fighting for women's suffrage, discussions about the future of that movement began to override family loyalty. Emmeline and Christabel disagreed openly with Sylvia's idea of using the intersectionality of women's rights and working class rights to build a proper socialist movement in Britain. The fight for women's suffrage was linked directly to the rights of men too. Before the First World War, only three-fifths of men in England had the right to vote in elections, meaning that many of those that volunteered to fight in the trenches had done so for a government they hadn't even chosen. The success of the women's campaign only elevated the urgency of the men's campaign too. During World War I, Emmeline and Christabel argued that the movement should pause and women should support the war effort without question. Both opposed pacifism and famously belittled men who refused to sign up and go to the front lines. Sylvia, on the other hand, was a dedicated pacifist. In 1918, following the war, a new law gave all men and a small section of wealthy women the right to vote. It had been a partial victory for the suffragette movement, but the campaign was not over. After the war, the schism between the Pankhursts only grew. The two younger Pankhursts, Sylvia and Adela, became increasingly socialists, while the older two, Emmeline and Christabel, drifted 
to the right. In 1926, Emmeline even stood for election for the Conservative Party in London, but failed to win. And that stubborn nature that had energised the WSPU early on now began to hold Emmeline back from creating more social change. She was so upset with her youngest daughter Adela's choices that she sent her to Australia to start a new life, knowing she would never see her again. Arguably, it was Sylvia's politics that stood the test of time. And when this statue of Emmeline was unveiled in 2019, many argued that the wrong Pankhurst was being honoured. By the way, Winston Churchill also played an interesting side role in the whole movement. Vehemently against women's suffrage for years, at one point he even pushed Sylvia into a chair after she approached him in public, he began to make cynical promises of support if he could have their backing during his election campaigns. However, in 1908, while Churchill was campaigning to keep his seat in the area, two women were campaigning against him. Eva and Constance Gore Booth, who rode around Manchester on a cart pulled by four white horses, handing out leaflets and urging people not to vote for him. He lost. Interestingly, Constance Gore Booth actually became the first woman in Britain to be elected as an MP. But because she stood in Dublin for Sinn Féin, she actually never took up her seat in Westminster. Across from the Panko statue in St Peter's Square is the Great Central Library. Built in 1934 and designed to look like the Pantheon in Rome, it was a landmark in Manchester's history. Now the decision to have a central library in any city seems quite obvious today, but think of it in its historical context. The whole idea of a free public library began here in Manchester, thanks to Humphrey Cheatham, nearly 300 years before. Sandwiched between both libraries, you've got the Industrial Revolution and the single-minded pursuit of profit at the expense of the majority of people in society. By the 1930s, however, there was a firm understanding that society needed a civic guiding hand. That a happy, healthy, educated public is actually a good thing. Now don't get me wrong, Britain was still a country dominated by an establishment of industrialists and landowners, but no longer did they have free reign to do as they pleased. It took radicals like those at Peterloo, Marx and the suffragettes to change all of that. But it also took some philanthropic thinking, people like Cheatham, Rylands and Gaskell, to name but a few, who donated to the public good. So this library might not be donated, but I think it symbolises that shift in attitude perfectly. And there you go, a history of the radical change taking place here in Manchester, which went out and influenced the rest of the country and to a certain extent the rest of the world. It's a story of the women and the men who fought for and campaigned for many of the rights we enjoy today, including minimum wage, working hours, sick pay, voting rights, and so on. These were all fought for and campaigned for over many generations, over such a long, long period of time, forcing the establishment to change the law to the will of the people. And remember, even after those tens of thousands of people had gathered at Peterloo and been attacked for demanding more political representation, amongst other things, it took another 99 years before all men in Britain got the right to vote. And 109 years before the same was granted to women too. Now, whether you're a socialist or a conservative, a progressive or a traditionalist, it's hard to argue that the emergence of the political left in Britain in the 19th century didn't force some much needed changes. A political vision inspired by Manchester. And as the 20th century unfolded, the political landscape of Manchester and Britain would be tested further by events big and small. Well, that's a story for another day. Next time we'll be looking at more extraordinary people who changed the world from here in Manchester. But that's not gonna be about politics or economics. It's going to be about maths and physics, computers and space. Manchester's ideas are about to get massive, super massive. <laughs>